Do you feel lost in the sea of information on raising bilingual and multilingual children? Let me summarize five popular strategies for you today in this video. And at the end of the video, I will show you some concrete results from our strategies of choice. Hello everybody, welcome to Ask Tetsu, where I share my pro tips on raising bilingual and multilingual children. I have a lot to share with you based on my own upbringing in 10 languages and my experience now raising four, four kids in five languages. So in order for you to follow their progress, I urge you to subscribe right now. The other day I uh, had the honor to present at the latest edition of the Polyglot Gathering. For those of you who don't know, this is a big event where polyglots, they, they gather and usually it's done, you know, they, they get together in Europe, somewhere in Europe, if it's been in Berlin or Br Bratislava, and this year, was, this year was supposed to be in uh, Poland. In Poland. Did I say that right? Poland. Yes. But, uh, of course, due to the whole corona situation, they had to put it online and, and they did a fantastic job and I had a lot of fun. And uh, so I had the the opportunity to present on some of my work on raising multilingual children and I just gave the presentation this past uh, two days ago and within this uh, my presentation I had a big section where I talked about where I summarized some of the uh, the main methods on raising multilingual children that we find online right now so I sort of summarized that information and I figured why not just take that information and also share it with my followers so Five, I summarized five uh, different uh, strategies. The first one is also my favorite, the one that I, we, that, that I use with our family, and that is the one person, one language method. It's also called one parent, one language. I believe it was originally called one parent, one language. And uh, the acronym is OPOL, O-P-O-L. And this is, uh, uh, it's, I think it's one of the most uh, popular uh, strategies. And, uh, it's a very simple strategy, so that's, that's one big advantage of this strategy. Simple concept, one person is responsible for one language in the household, and this person will always speak that same one language with the kids. So if you have parents who have speak different languages, they, you, they each will be, the, will be the designated driver for that language. So, very simple, and it's easy to keep the consistency with the kids. So that's, that's like the big pros of this, uh, this method. On the other hand, Obviously, not all of us are in uh, cross-cultural um, relationships. Uh, we don't always have different people who could serve as the designated person for that language. So that's a uh, that's one of the difficulties uh, that I would say for this uh, for this method. And also, um, with this method, when you are holding uh, the responsibility for one of those languages that are not spoken outside of the home or with with your friends and family, the, the majority language, I guess, with the local community, then you have to always be thinking about how you want to be considerate of other people who are in the same conversation as you if they're, if they're there. So do you talk to your children in that specific language but also translate for your friends? Or do you simply switch to another language during those times? That's, you know, different things that you have to consider. And uh, so this, this adds an, an element of discipline, I guess, for the parent who's uh, Who's, who's in charge of that language. So the next method I want to talk to you about is, actually it's quite similar, it's called two parents, two languages. 2P, 2L. It's actually quite, uh, well it's not, I don't know if it's new, but it's a, it's a language It's a language method that I did not know until quite recently. I, I just stumbled upon this uh, this blog post by Rita Rosenbach, who's, uh, who's one of my go-to authorities in, this, uh, in the field of raising multilingual children. And, uh, and I read her, her post, first thing that came to mind is two people switching around in the two languages with the kids. Immediately it sort of goes against what I always believe, which is consistency with one language uh, with the children. But the more I dug into this, I, I've really come to realize that under certain conditions this, is, this could be a very, very uh, effective method. Uh, so I think the premise of this me method is that you need parents who are bilingual. At least one needs to be bilingual. And, um, and so in the household, these parents, often they're both bilingual. They would use these two languages ad, ad hoc to a certain degree. It's very free. So, so that is one big pros is that it's simple. You have two languages, you use it whenever you want. 
But I think one important aspect of this is that you need to make sure that you have a good balance of both, uh, of both languages. So you can switch around, but you need to make sure that the exposure of each language is balanced. So, so this is, I guess, one part of the, the cons, I would say, that for one thing you need bilingual parents. A at least one, ideally both. And to really make this a good method, I, I believe you also need the environment, like outside of, of the house. So that means people outside are also bilingual. So this is kind of difficult for countries that, that are quite monolingual, or at least the, the, the local community, if it's really monolingual, then this may be a little harder. So for example, I live near Montreal, and this is a, it's one of the most bilingual cities, I think, in North America. And uh, you will always, you know, sp any day you spend in Montreal, you'll most likely hear both languages, so English and French. If you go into a store, people say, bonjour, hi. It's always bonjour, hi, because they don't know if the client is an Anglophone or a, or a Francophone. So these two languages are very prominent in the local community, and hence if you are a mixed family, uh, you know, Quebec, a local Quebecer, I guess, uh, French-speaking or English-speaking, if you use both languages at home, doing this two-person, two-language strategy, I think it will work very well. And so I'm going to talk about the third strategy, and I sort of touched upon it a little bit, but it, and it's called minority language at home. It's quite simple. If you, if, if you're, let's say, uh, an immigrant family uh, from China to the U.S., then you would speak Mandarin at home. Dad, mom, both speak Mandarin at home. Keep it at home. And the kids will learn English outside, so you just don't use English, at least the parents don't use English uh, with the kids. Uh, and the kids will simply associate this language for, with the home, with the parents. And it works very well. Uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned, when I grew up uh, in Taiwan, the only input I got of Japanese was with my mom. I spoke Japanese with my, with my mom, and she would rent videos, uh, Japanese mangas, uh, and I would watch that. That was the only input I had, but that allowed me to speak Japanese to a native level. So that's, that's a, so minority language at home works very well, especially if you had two, if both parents, my father is Taiwanese, so I never spoke Japanese with him. Although when we're all together, we would speak Japanese. But I speak ja Japanese with mom, Mandarin with dad, and that was enough for me to pick up Japanese very well uh, as I grew up in Taiwan. So one of the major advantages of the strategy of minority language at home is, again, it is simple. Sometimes it is as simple as just the parents speaking their native tongue. So this allows for easy, you know, consistency, you know, consistency, and uh, and and it allows the, the children to really associate the language easily. Now, sometimes for whatever reason, the parents sort of feel compelled to use the the local language or the, the community language so we often see, see Japanese or Chinese or whatever immigrants who go to a different country and they feel compelled to use the local language over their own uh, native tongue and that's that's in that case then obviously it, it's much difficult it's much more difficult for the kids to pick up your language since you're not really using it with them and they really won't have so much input uh, other than yourself so you can, if you switch around uh, with the local language and your native language, then the, the probability of success are much reduced. Especially if you, uh, as the kids grow, their, their majority language becomes stronger and stronger, they have a tendency to start to develop some resistance to the local, uh, to the, to your native language. So that's something to consider. And now for the fourth strategy. Now, now we're moving away from this association of people with the language. The, no, the next one is called time and place. So instead of person, we are now associating a language with a time. For example, the morning versus the afternoon. English in the morning, French in the afternoon, at night. Or days, Monday it's English, Tuesday it's French. Or it could be a week of this, a week of that. So that's the time time element, or it can also be a place. You can speak English in the kitchen, Spanish in the living room, or 
another language in the in the playing room, the bedroom, whatever. It can be in the house, and then at the arena, at school. You get the idea. So, so the biggest pros that we can think about with uh, with this type of uh, strategy is that now instead of designated people, persons who will have a specific language, now you have one person yourself. You can now be able to teach many languages to your kids. Um, so clearly it will, it will cost you less than if you hire au pairs like, like us. Um, and uh, you, will, you will have to, you will be able to really pass on the languages the way you want. And uh, that's, that's definitely a, a flexibility and uh, a way for you to really control how you want to teach your children. Now on the flip side, uh, this would require a lot of discipline. Uh, it's something that I don't think I can do because I'd, I'd wake up every day thinking, wow, what day is it? <laughs> or, or where am I right now? And, and that kind of uh, association is quite difficult for us, especially considering that we're doing five languages. So this many languages and now, you know, yeah, start thinking about time and, and place and it gets messy very quickly. So I think that's one uh, one difficulty for our situation and also another one that I would that, that I think is quite important and you really need to assess well at the beginning is your children's interest in the languages I think my kids and most kids neither love nor hate languages they just they just don't really care about languages so in order to do something like time and place you need to find a way to make it interesting, make it fun, so that the kids have a motivation to learn the languages that you want them to practice. So that's, that's another level of, of difficulty or another level of challenge that I think you have to think through at the beginning. So if you think you, you can do it, if, if you already see signs of tremendous interest in languages uh, from your child, then this, is, this could be something that's, that would be very effective. But now number five. This method is something that I did not know of until quite recently. I just found this uh, one day on the Multilingual Family YouTube channel from my fellow YouTuber Andrea. And uh, this, this method is called One Accessory, One Language. So you had OPO, now it's O-W-O-L. <laughs> o -A -O -L. And uh, so, so one accessory, for example, a hat or, or a little keychain or something. I remember seeing Andrea you know, having this big red hat and, uh, and whenever she puts that on, her, her daughter would switch to, I think, Swiss German. <laughs> they would talk Swiss German the whole time. Andrea herself has some, I, I believe she's from Ecuador. She has some Ecuadorian heritage uh, and also Swiss heritage. Her husband, I think, is from Denmark. So they've, they've also got this three, four language thing going on at home uh, and, and, and more, I think. So they have some major languages and, and others that they are, that, that are less prioritized. And perhaps, for, you know, this, this type of uh, method, this one accessory, one language would probably be for those that are, this, the languages that are less prioritized. So she's a language specialist and she uh, comes up with all these different ideas. This is one of them. And I believe she would know, you know how to keep her child's interest high. So, so this is an, a method that would work very well in, in her situation. And it, it's quite similar to time and place in that there's a lot of flexibility. One person can teach you know, as many languages as this person wants to the kids. Uh, but once again, for, for me, it's something that would cost too much in terms of, of memory. <laughs> I would have to remember which thing goes to what. And with five languages going around all the time with different people, uh, it's something that I've never tried. Uh, but it could be a fun game, I think. If, if, if it's not a language that you really want your kids to take to a very high level, something that they could just learn and have fun with, uh, I do recommend it. It would be something to, to try out. So. With these five languages that I've explained to you, I think you've already uh, been able to figure out that for us, what we do, the, the big strategies that we have is basically one person, one language combined with minority language at home. So if you see the picture of our family, how it's set up, myself and my father, we would speak Mandarin with the kids. 
and my wife and my mother, who are both Japanese, they speak Japanese with the kids. So that's minority language at home, automatically. Uh, the parents speak the minority languages at home, and the fact that we separate it is OPPO. So there's an overlap. And we further introduced different languages within the house by bringing in au pairs from uh, one from Mexico for Spanish. She would speak Spanish all the time with the kids. And also we have, at that time we had an au pair from Denmark and uh, she spoke very good English and she spoke English with the kids. Now, we don't always have uh, a person in charge of English, but it's, it's on and off. Uh, this past year we had actually, instead of an au pair, we had an exchange student. So that's also another way you could introduce a, langu a language in your house without excessive costs, I guess. An exchange student does not uh, have uh, as much cost that you need to think about. And uh, finally, our local community is in French, so it's represented here by Ronnie's friends. Uh, whenever Ronnie has friends come on, we, when we have friends come over, then French is uh, the language that would be used. And of course, being in Quebec, there's, or in Canada, of course, being in Canada, we have lots of uh, input uh, in English. So Ronnie's skating coaches uh, speak English, or my daughter's horseback riding coach speaks English. So there's different places where we could, you know, get fragmented, but you know, good input of English in Quebec. So that's one snapshot of our family uh, within the house. But what else can we leverage? And we can think about, for example, we have we still have family in Japan and Taiwan, and we we try to leverage that to the you know to, to the maximum by going to Japan and Taiwan for two months each every year. Now this year with Corona, it was a little difficult, for, so they're going to stay in Japan the whole time. But every year, usually we go at the end of uh, end of April and we stay until end of uh, June in Japan and then July, August in Taiwan and then we come back and we start the cycle again with another eight months in Canada and then we go back. So that's that's how we ensure that we have a good balance of the five languages for our kids. And what about you? You know, I'm sure we don't have a, exactly the same family arrangement but are there parallels that you can think of? Perhaps you live in Europe, you live maybe, maybe you're, you're French or, or, or English and you live in a third you know, country uh, and your wife or your husband is from another country, your partner. Uh, in today's world with globalization, all sorts of combination is possible. So if you know where, what the options are, there must be a way that you could find something that you can use in there for you. So with that, I. As promised, I will show you kind of the outcome, the output of everything that we're applying right now uh, in our household. So here's a little clip. It's quite a rare clip where you have one minute uh, of footage that where you see Ronnie speak all five languages just switching around very quickly. So it's a short clip. Ronnie's friends are here, so that's French with the friends. Spanish with au pair Andrea, English with au pair Caroline, Japanese with mom, and I'm behind the camera speaking to him in Mandarin. Check it out. So, how did you like the video? If you're interested in knowing more about our OPPO method, 
Go check out the videos that's showing up below. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, comment, and share, and subscribe. Oh, and don't forget to ring that notification bell so that you can follow our kids' progress and join our adventures in real time.